Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, we at the Jewish Prudence Discussion Group and the Foundation of Law and Constitutional Government are thrilled to have with us here three fantastic commentators that are going to comment on Marisus Kopke's new book, Legal Validity, The Fabric of Justice. And just so you know, we have flyers here for anyone who wants to purchase the book with fantastic discounts. And then once in a lifetime offer, there are three or four copies here which can be purchased for cash for only £40. Fantastic deal. Um, the structure today will be that we start with the commentators and in the end we'll have Mattis uh, responding. So the first off is Raquel Paratas de Freitas from Oxford. Thank you. Right, so um, before I begin, a very quick caveat. Um, when I returned to Maris's book um, in order to prepare my remarks for today, I, I noticed a small pencil, very delicate pencil drawing of an open umbrella next to the um, headings of certain sections of the book. I recognised the lines immediately. It was very, very clear that Maris herself had drawn the umbrella. And it was also clear what they were alluding to. Let me just say that it has something to do with Mary Poppins <laughs> and leave it at that. Um, but it wasn't clear what function they had there. Um, and there seemed to be two options. Either they were suggesting what I should pay attention to, or they were predicting what I would pay attention to. And as it turns out, um, there is quite some overlap um, between the points I will make today and the umbrella points. So, um, either I will have been excessively influenced by Maris's own judgment about what is worthy of attention in her book, or I will be very predictable in what I say. Neither option is particularly exciting, so I apologize in advance. But the book is very exciting, um, and I couldn't be more delighted, um, both as a colleague and as a friend, to see it published and to be here today to talk about it. So many thanks to Nick Barber for inviting me um, to be here today and to the conveners of the JDG for organizing the, the event. Right, so Maris writes on page 69 of the book, Validity is a hazardous technique, um, and yet legal regulation can be just. I think this idea is the kernel of the book. Um, it focuses on legal validity, as you can see by the title. And legal validity is a concept that lawyers tend to take for granted and leave relatively undisturbed. Um, lawyers breathe legal validity like the air, right? Legal validity is treated, as Maris um, says, as a currency of undiscussed value. And asking a legal practitioner um, about legal validity is a bit similar to asking two, the two fish in David Foster Wallace's um, parable, how's the water, boy? Of course, in the parable, one of the fish looks at the other and asks, what is water? <laughs> I, I think something similar seems to happen with talk of legal validity. Um, according to Maris in this book, we are all under validity's spell, right? We settle questions of justice. Um, by, without freshly reflecting about what justice requires. And often, unreflectively, as she tells us, replace justice with something else, the property of legal validity, which we take to be um, self-explanatory and yet are unable to grasp fully. Legal validity, however, has not been neglected by legal philosophers. On the contrary, we find many writings and contemporary jurisprudence in which the context, the concept of legal validity is addressed. We find questions such as what is the nature of criteria of legal validity, what makes it the case that something is legally valid, or what things are legally valid um, around the literature. And we also find very different and sometimes compelling answers to, to that question um, offered by different legal philosophers. The book gives special attention to the views advanced by Kelsen, by Hart, um, by Dworkin and Raz. But the book identifies one particular neglected question um, among the set of available conceptions of legal validity that we find in the literature. And the question is, what is the moral point of legal validity? And the book addresses this very neglected concern by pursuing a central question, which is clearly identified at the outset and then re-emerges um, at various junctures in the book. And the question is, how and within what general limits can legal validity help a large community to foster justice, precisely by helping it bypass concerns of justice? Or in a more Dworkinian, um, in more Dworkinian vein, why can it be warranted in justice to settle questions of justice through legal technique? So we see that the central question of, of the book, or that the book tries to set out to answer, is a question of normative legal philosophy. The book addresses it directly with 
subtlety and economy, carefully unpacking it and detangling a remarkable, with remarkable clarity, a complex web of abstract issues. But rather than offering definitive answers to the questions it raises, the book gives us, I think, a unified, distinctive approach to these questions. And the structure of the book reflects its argumentative strategy very clearly, so the reader is unlikely to get lost along the way. The writing is very clear and very elegant, and the ideas are discussed with great rigor and attention to detail, and Maris's use of examples um, often brings insight and humor into what might otherwise be thought a very arid topic. Um, so, I mean, one more thing, the aim um, that, Mary, uh, that Maris sets to um, make the main, test, the, the main text self-sufficient in its argumentative import is achieved very, very successfully, I think, throughout the book. Okay, so now it's time to zoom in. I'll, I'll, I'll raise a few points. I won't be disagreeing with Maris. It's extremely difficult to disagree with him. Um, I'll raise some points that I think would be interesting to, to hear a little bit more about. So the, the first one is, you write, Maris, um, valid legal choices, valid choices are choices of a special kind. And they're choices of a special kind because they're self-fulfilling. And then you argue in the book, um, you say, they are self-fulfilling because they become true in being expressed. But choices can't be true or false, right? Um, unlike propositions, choices are acts, as you say in the book. As such, you know, they can be right, they can be wrong, they can be foolish, they can be selfish, they can be you know, sensible, irrational, etc. But they can't be true or false, right? Um, a proposition, according to which a particular choice has been made in law can be true or false, perhaps, but the act of choosing cannot. So perhaps what we should understand your claim to be is rather that valid choices are self-fulfilling and thus different in kind from other choices because they are made, meaning the act of choosing is performed simply by being expressed. Right? Is this right? But what is the relevant, um, what is relevantly expressed? Is it the reflexive intention to make a valid choice? The intention to, to change particular rights, duties, or powers, both moral and legal? Or the intention to perform the specific act that one is in fact performing? Perhaps the answer is that it doesn't really matter because the technique of legal validity erases the distinction among these different things. Second point, you say not only are we under validity's spell, we also have a moral need for this spell. The reason why we have this moral need, you say, is that we have a moral need to settle questions of justice without thinking afresh each time about the demands of justice. And law, you say, is particularly well equipped to do this, precisely in virtue of this spell. So my question is, does saying that we have a moral need for the spell of validity entail that we have a moral right to the use of the technique of validity as a replacement for reasoning about the demands of justice? You say on page 83, connected in a way connected to this, that legal systems are especially apt to generate and sustain the kind of specific convergence justice calls for. This means, of course, um, the implication is that we have moral reasons to have and maintain legal systems. But do we also have a moral right to law or to a legal system? Do we as individuals and as members of political communities um, have a moral right to legal regulation? Another point. There are stringent considerations of justice, you tell us. Why what falls to be settled through law ought to be settled by using the technique of validity. Now, I think we should note that this question is distinct, very different, from the question of what ought to be settled through law. And you say yourself um, on page 163 that not all questions of justice, let alone all questions of morality, all moral questions, ought to be addressed by law, right? And towards the end of the book, you also speak of the moral hazards of validity, including the fact that it can perpetuate, as you say, injustice, precisely by rendering it invisible, unaddressed, condone. You say that validity spell can be perverse, right? So can we conclude, on your view, that the technique of legal validity is essential to law, qua law, 
in virtue precisely of its being key to law's capacity to realize justice. Another point, the ability to make law. You, you define this as the ability to act validly, and you say it's inherently vicarious. And in this, you follow Kelsen, or you agree with Kelsen. And the point you're making, um, this, and this is on, right at the beginning on page eight, is that the ability to act validly is a function of the acts of others. And this is a very important point in the book. But to say this, of course, is to say that it is possible only in virtue of someone else's previous action or chain of action. The result, you say, is empowerment. It isn't possible to act validly without having been empowered to do so by someone. Now, the term vicarious could suggest something slightly different. It could suggest that something is done by A instead of B, or something is done by A on behalf of B, on B's behalf. But this is a minor detail. I think two sets of um, questions are, um, arise here. First, making law, as you say in the book, is not the only way of acting validly. But can someone make law without acting validly? Can one make law without making valid law? The second set of questions is, can law exist without being made, right? Does law or lawmaking amount to valid acting? Can some law exist, like Hart suggested, not by being valid, but by being practiced? What concept of lawmaking are you relying on? John Gardner, for example, distinguish, this distinguishes lawmaking from enacting. Law can be made by enactment, or it can be made by being announced, practiced, invoked, enforced, endorsed, accepted, or otherwise, or otherwise engaged with by a judge or an empowered official. In both cases, law is posited. So positing and making law are the same thing. And the implication is that all made law is valid. Do you accept this implication? An additional point. You write, and this is central to your argument in the book, it is morally necessary that law be positive, that is, crafted through human acts. And in laying out your argument in support of this claim, you refer to the moral need for different agents and spheres of power to speak in one legally salient voice. Political communities, you say, have a need for relatively determinate, easily identifiable standards which are crafted in a relatively targeted fashion. And I was quoting you. You then mention two broad sets of views in the literature. On one set of views, the only way in which we can, law can do its morally salient job of identifying legal requirements in this way is by avoiding moral judgment. On another set of views, the identification of legal requirements in a just community necessarily involves moral judgment through and through, to the point, you add, that only expert judges may be able to pin it down correctly. But is this not a contradiction? Are judges moral experts? Can they be? And if not, what kind of expertise, if any, do we or should we associate with the judicial role on the views you critique and on your own view? You then write, such human acts of crafting are systemically related to one another through and through time. This sheds light on what you call the systemic character of legal meaning. This notion is closely linked, intimately linked, to the positivity of law, which you define as the fact that legal positions are determined by the legal meaning of valid acts rather than by moral considerations, which are not part of the meaning of valid acts, of the legal meaning of valid acts. So my predictable question is, what does this view of legal meaning tell us about the nature of legal interpretation? What implications does it have for what we say about where lawmaking should end and law applying should begin, in Gardner's words, and also about the difference, if any, between legal meaning and the content of the law? Gardner, again, says that it's a mistake to think that the interpretation of legal norms belongs exclusively to the law-applying stage of legal reasoning, as opposed to the law-making stage. He tells us that interpretive activity straddles the distinction between, identifi be be sorry, between the identification of existing legal norms and the further use of them to make new legal norms. Do you agree? Also, 
considering what you call the systemic character of legal meaning and also your definition of legal meaning as what the act means in law, that is, the set of legal positions that it changes, do you think there is a general judicial duty to interpret, defined as Raz does, as the duty to explain legal meaning in the process of resolving a case? Finally, to conclude, um, there's much to be said, I think, about the value of self-direction, and I can't hope to begin to do that here. But the claim that Maris makes, that the value of self-directing choice is a reason to confer and withhold legal power alongside relative expertise, institutional capacity, proximity to relevant facts and the requirements of the rule of law, I find that claim very compelling. So let me finish with a passage um, from the book that I particularly like. It speaks to the point, which is also central to the argument in the book, that self-direction grounds the moral need for law's positivity. Maris writes on page 75, part of the value of the undetermined, underdetermined choice lies precisely in its forging paths and making bets that upon and because of that choosing will deserve a special call on the chooser's attention, even though prior to their choice, there were just some, they were just some among many options reasonably open to pursuit, and even though they may eventually unravel as a mistake, such as the challenge, the peril, and the beauty of living one's own life. Now there's a note to myself that I made on page 163 of my copy of the book. It reads, think about how to make this gel. Now the truth is I, I don't really need to do that because Maris does that beautifully in the book. Uh, thank you very much, Rocco. Uh, next up is Mikolai Barsentovitz from University of Surrey. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to be here and to, to be able to share with you why I'm grateful to Maris for this book. And, uh, and my comment will have a, a special kind of a character because, uh, because Maris's book... Uh, so I, was, I wasn't in, uh, a disinterested reader of the book because uh, the Maris's discussion of, of legal powers was uh, was very close to what I was doing at the at the time I was reading her book, which was writing my own chapter on of legal powers and my own default. So, so in a sense, the my my comments are from a perspective of someone um, someone writing a default and uh, and using uh, Maris's uh, um, Maris's work. Uh, um, which which was indeed very helpful for me. So so that's um, so I will focus on two chapters of, of the book, on chapters two and three, which um, which deal with um, this technical issue, uh, but very important issue of what are legal powers, i.e., what is this, uh, what, what is what Maris calls uh, uh, the special technique uh, of uh, legal validity, and. Uh, um, and I think that the account that Mary suffers is, 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 is a sophisticated one and it's based on a, a thorough critical engagement with the literature. And I also think that it has this very welcome virtue of being correct. Mm. Um, uh, so, Which isn't everything. <laughs> no, it's not everything, but it's, it's a good thing. Um, so the, the way, the way uh, Mary's laid out her argument in chapters two and three uh, by first surveying the key views on legal powers and showing their deficiencies immediately inspired my confidence that she, she really gets it and she's not uh, leaving out anything. And, and it may sound like faint, pra uh, faint praise, but uh, I assure you it is not. I read, I read Maris's text just after reading most of the literature that, uh, that she discusses. And I, I must say that reading her discussion felt like a, a breath of uh, fresh air. So I, I don't think... Um, um, and I don't think I felt that uh, only or even predominantly just because I share her uh, conclusions. Um, what I think was more important was the scholarly quality of, of Maris's argument. So what is Maris's view on, uh, on legal powers? Spoiler alert uh, uh, for, for those of you who are planning to read the book as you all should. Um, to give you some context, I will simplify, I will give you a very simplified picture of, uh, of uh, of one axis of the debate on legal powers, so one major definitional question. What is the place of intention to bring about a specific legal effect within a definition of a legal power? On the one end, 
of, um, of the spectrum, we can place Hochfeld's answer to, to this question, which was that such intention, specifically to bring about some legal effect, was illegally irrelevant. The only constitutive thing is that the law ascribes legal effect to someone's volitional action. This means that by an act of committing murder, we, the murderer exercises a legal power to make themselves liable for murder. That is a, a consequence of Hochfeld's view. So that's one end of the spectrum. On the other end of the spectrum, we have the uh, various versions of the real will theory, uh, like Andrew Halpin's view. And according to, uh, to, to this family of views, actual intention or real will to bring about a specific legal effect is necessary for an exercise of the legal power. What then, for example, about contracts where at least one party did not in, in, uh, intend, actually intend to enter the contract, but is taken by the law to, as having manifested intent to enter and thus as bound by the contract. Well, for real will folk, this kind of contracting cannot be an exercise of illegal power. So this is a bullet they must and do bite. Uh, and I hope we can agree, or at least you can agree with Maris and I, that these extreme views are quite far and I say too far from the or ordinary legal use of the concept of a legal power in probably all modern legal systems, both extremes, Hochfelds and Halpins and others. So, um, and between those extremes, there is a variety of views, including those presented by Hart and Raz, uh, rightly, I think, uh, criticized by Maris. And um, you'll have to ask Maris or, uh, or read the book to learn what, exactly what her criticism of Hart and Raz was, because I want, I want to focus on something else. Maris's uh, own middle-of-the-road solution, which uh, is closest to Neil McCormick's view and to a recent paper by Lars uh, Lindell and da uh, David uh, Rydov, um, is that exercises of legal powers uh, necessarily manifest real or imputed intent to bring about some specific legal effect. Uh, as Maris wrote, it does not take an intention to manifest an intention. Maris also stressed that a valid say-so can invoke a legal regime beyond what is ostensibly in the mind of the sayer. Hence, it is not required that, for instance, a customer knows much or perhaps anything about the law of contract uh, in order for them to be able to validly exercise their power to enter uh, into a contract. Given all this, I'd like to turn to the aspect of legal powers that I find mo most interesting. No surprise here. Um, well, uh, and, and I find this aspect of legal powers so, so, so interesting that I, uh, I, I wrote 85,000 words about it. Um, one of the key things I keep stressing in my own work uh, is that just because the law enables us to do things or facilitates uh, us in, in doing things, uh, and especially in changing legal positions, uh, and because it facilitates us through legal powers, it does not follow that this is the only way the law enables us to change legal positions. So the law, um, the law also sometimes facilitates us in changing legal positions or bringing about legal effects without any legal powers being involved. Uh, and um, so I think Maris agrees, and, and uh, we both see, for example, Neil McCormick's uh, super Trump, uh, uh, who intentionally gets, uh, gets himself arrested to seek shelter in a jail, as not exercising a legal power to make himself liable for breaking, breaking and entering or whatever th that offense, uh, uh, the uh, other offenses he ends up committing. So there is no legal power there because the super Trump's real or imputed intent specifically to make himself criminally liable is legally irrelevant to, his, to whether he is, in fact, criminally liable. Uh, now, what about legal powers to change the law? That is, to change general legal rules. There are many other examples, but I will focus on judges um, and case law. And my question is, is it necessarily the case that whenever the law ascribes law-changing effects to adjudication, it follows that the courts have a legal power specifically to change the law? And I made it my business to convince people uh, that the answer is no. Uh, it is, on my view, very much possible to have a doctrine of precedent or case law without judges having legal powers to change the law. And in arguing this, I 
in, I'm in a way generalizing a point made by uh, Grand Lamont in, uh, in his paper on uh, do precedent, uh, precedents create rules. So I will give you two examples that I think suggest that law changing uh, adjudication may contingently be like the case of the super trend. Uh, that is, we're intent or even imputed to bring about uh, this specific legal effect is legally irrelevant. First, as you know, many legal systems, especially of the continental family, seem to have uh, as a key part of their official story or ideology that uh, this notion that judges don't get to change the law. And this notion is so prominent that it is, it is not hard to find examples of judges saying explicitly in their judgments that they cannot change the law. Uh, and uh, that their, for example, that their judgment is entirely limited in its legal effect to the parties. That's in continental literature, this is often characterized in terms of, of inter partis effect versus erga omnes. Um, now, we also know that it is usually to some extent a fiction. Despite all protestations of, of the judges, judgments tend to have law-changing force in France, in Germany, in Poland. Um, however, I do think that this is a reason for us to doubt that there are legal powers at play. Um, second, even in the common law world, we can observe a phenomenon that Josh Blackman called unprecedented. Uh, an attempt, uh, an unprecedented is an attempt of a high court to avoid establishing a precedent. One famous example of that is the language used by the U.S. Supreme Court in Bush v. Gore. Uh, and, uh, and as I keep telling people on Twitter, the first paragraph of, of Miller II, Cherry Judgment, uh, also looks like an attempt to get away with an unprecedented. Uh, the case, quote, arises in, the circ in circumstances which have never arisen before and are unlikely ever to arise again, full stop. It is a one-off, full stop. That's from uh, sentence three of Miller II. Um, as Blackman noted, the problem is that lower courts tend to ignore statements of this kind. Um, and if explicit in, in indications of no intent to bring about uh, some legal effect are legally irrelevant, uh, are we really dealing with a legal power? One difficult question here is how to discover what is the threshold for, for a clear indication of no intent. After all, if I enter a city bus while shouting that I intend to ride for free, uh, um, this may very well be legal real, irrelevant and an intent to contract my, um, under the company's general, the bus company's general terms will still be imputed to me. Uh, however, you could have a contract law regime where such contrary ind indication is effective. If, for example, the bus driver doesn't throw me out uh, and by not throwing out, uh, he then could be consenting to my terms as an agent of the company and my terms that I write for free, something like that. Um, thus, I am, con I am convinced that it is possible, uh, it is contingently possible, that law could ascribe law-changing effects to adjudication, for example, through the doctrine of precedent, without conferring on judges any legal power specifically to change the law. In the Hartian framework, this is to be explained by the operation of rules of recognition. And if you want to know more, read my DFIL or wait, better wait for the book. <laughs> if, if, if someone decides to publish it. Um, however, I, I don't yet have a fully satisfactory answer to the epistemic question of how to ascertain whether judges have such legal powers, for example, in English law or in US federal law. So I'm quite curious what Maris thinks about this, especially this epistemic question. And I wish to end by, by saying that I found um, chapters two and three and, and the book in general very helpful due to Maris's meticulous engagement with, uh, with the literature and, and her referencing, both through footnotes and, and through endnotes that she offered at the end of every chapter. And for those of you who haven't read the book, uh, Maris's endnotes offer, offer critical surveys of uh, broader or background debates, uh, notably not limited to uh, UK and US literature, you'll find lots of Italian, South American stuff, um, um, Spanish of course. Uh, thus, I, I think that anyone, especially DPhil students, uh, writing on validity and legal powers will benefit, as I did, from, from using uh, her book uh, as a reference. And I also think that Maris's strategy of separating her main argument 
from what she did in the end notes was very effective in keeping her narrative focused, as, as, as Raquel said, uh, while at the same time offering the sort of background content that uh, some someone researching similar topics would uh, would welcome. So so and perhaps this is a golden mean between having bloated footnotes and and no footnotes at, at all. I, I don't know, but but I, I found that uh, very effective and, and interesting. And I and I wonder what was Maris's thinking in in uh, making that presentational choice. And this is all I wanted to say. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mikolai. And next up is Timothy Antikor of the University of Oxford. Thank you, Sunny. Thank you, Nick, for organizing this. What a brilliant book. It's, uh, it just lit up uh, here, there, and everywhere with extraordinary insights, uh, beautifully expressed. Here's just one, one of my favorites. Um, the idea of application of law is somewhat nebulous. We know what it means to apply hand cream, but it is less conspicuous just what it means to apply law. And then Maris goes on to explain what it means to her apply law. Um, uh, in an important sense, focus on valid norms and their criteria of validity is an offshoot, perhaps a creature, of modern constitutionalism. I, I just it, this is the sort of thing that gets you thinking in new ways about, um, about aspects of problems that the philosophers have been working on for thousands of years that hadn't occurred to me before. Um, and that happens again and again, and I, I predict that you'll have that experience if, when you read the book. Um, preparing to, for this uh, wonderful event, I, I watched um, the Dick Van Dyke show. It had nothing to do with Mary Poppins. Um, the Dick Van Dyke show, <laughs> I, I think a, a rather brilliant, uh, a brilliant comedy from the 1960s. Robin Laura Petrie, Mary Tyler Moore, and Dick Van Dyke. Uh, um, I've been married for years. They've got a 10-year-old little boy. And in episode 66, Laura's Little Lie, um, they apply for insurance. And, uh, so, and it's 1963, so they have to produce Laura's, their, their marriage certificate. And the insurance agent turns them down because her date of birth is different on the application for insurance from, it, from the marriage certificate. And it's a crisis, and she bursts into floods of tears and, and confesses to uh, Rob, her husband, that she lied about her age on her marriage certificate. And under the law of Connecticut, <laughs> um, it's invalid. The marriage is invalid. Um, and I, 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 uh, another spoiler alert for you. Um, it, 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 it results in chaos in between them, and it's really, they're really rather good. Uh, they end up in an awful, awful big row, big fight about this, uh, which illustrates the point of, of Maris's book, the value for people like Rob and Laura of, of a way of arranging things that, uh, that, is, that is valid. They're, they're really in the soup when, when, uh, it, when it's not valid, and, um, and, and they obviously have to, they're going to elope and go through another form of marriage, but they have a big fight about whether they're going to do that, and, and but they do. Rob says, "I'm I'm only going to do it because I'm not a Welcher." Now this is this is relevant to a point that I'm going to come back uh, to, um, which is if you look at Rob's attitude to this transaction, um, uh, he wouldn't marry her in a million years after they have this uh, big fight, uh, except that he 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 said he would go through a second form of marriage in in, in Connecticut. Um, and uh, and so he's uh, he's treating not being a, a welcher as a thing his own his own way of uh, you might say regulating the validity of his commitments. I'll come back to that to, to the uh, uh, the main question I have about the nature of validity. Um, so uh, out of a sheer, sheer spite against each other, I, I think Laura's attitude is that. She wouldn't go through another form of marriage in a million years, except it's going to cause him so much pain that she's going to do it. Uh, and they get in front of a, a, a judge who conducts marriages, and he refuses to marriage many of them because they're obviously <laughs> um, um, incompatible, uh, poor misfits who would be doomed to a late life of, of, um, of misery if he married them. But they get over that and he marries them, and then it's okay. 
and, and they've got a valid marriage and they move forward. It's a, it's a picture of the, of the value of what Maris calls a technique um, of validity. Um, and, and I recommend it. It's just a reminder to us all of how useful it is for a marriage to be valid. Now, um, uh, here's my, my big question. It connects with something Raquel asked about. Raquel said, can one make law without making valid law? I'm, I'm, I had a sort of similar idea in my mind, and I wondered whether um, whether we really ought to have a redundancy theory of validity. Validity is merely redundant. Um, that doesn't mean you shouldn't write a book about, about validity. Truth is redundant, and philosophers write books with the word truth in the title. Um, if you say the book has been published, and your friend says, it's true that the book has been published. Well, they haven't, uh, they, they, they've said two different things, haven't they? Um, and, but you might say that, that um, predicating truth with the proposition uh, doesn't tell us anything more than uh, predi predicating publication of the book. Uh, it's, it's redundant to say that it's true. Now, and, and there are philosophers who are redundancy theories of truth. Those philosophers, of course, won't tell you stop using the word true. Stop using the word true. Don't say it's true that the book was published. Just say that the book was published. It, it can be tremendously useful to have the notion of truth. Um, and likewise, it can be terrifically useful to have the notion of validity and valuable to have a book that treats it as a way of looking at um, the subject matter of legal philosophy. But uh, would a redundancy theory of validity be a good theory? Um, now, you might say Kelsen had one. And um, my main question about Kelsen for Maris is roughly, um, although his theory of law was a disaster, um, did he have exactly right the right answer to your question of the nature of validity and of legal validity in particular um, he says validity is the specific existence of norms I, I think that's rather beautiful has a sort of same sort of elegance that you find in, in Maris's writing validity is the sp specific existence of norms a norm isn't a norm if it's not valid a marriage is not a marriage um, to say that it's a marriage is to say that it's valid. Um, and then to have this term in our toolkit is like having the term truth in our toolkit. Um, now, I find that very attractive, and I'm wondering, Maris, whether you actually um, disagree with it. Hart's, Hart talks as if he disagrees with it. I find it rather peculiar. He says the rule of recognition is not neither valid nor invalid. People will remember that um, proclamation um, from the concept of law. And he treats validity as a specifically legal term um, that is, uh, that, uh, that means um, compatibility with the criteria provided by a rule of recognition for law. And then maybe Hart would say that a, a contract is valid only if and only if it's a contract. Um, but it's not, uh, it's not redundant because it's a way of saying that it's, you, you're giving information that, it, that the contract satisfies criteria for validity. Um, whereas uh, he, he apparently doesn't say the same about norms. Um, a, a rule of recognition um, is a rule according to him, but he denies that it's valid or invalid. I find this peculiar. Why not? Why not say it's valid? Suppose Rob and Laura met each other on a desert island. No legal system available. No, it's not Connecticut. Uh, no law of marriage and no judge uh, to marry them. And they decide to get married. And um, they grew up in Connecticut, so they've got a puzzle about because they're pretty, law's a pretty big thing to them. And they decide to get married anyway. Um, and why not uh, say that they're, they've got a valid marriage? 
or you might, might say the same in the same way that you might say about valid laws, well, from their point of view within their the normative uh, system, if you can call it systematic, that they've but in in their norms in their um, practice, uh, the marriage is valid. And then years later, Laura says she lied about her age. You'd have a different, you might say, unregulated dispute about the validity of the marriage. There's nothing ungrammatical about that, but you can see how it's kind of an attraction in Hart's way of talking, just because it sounds a little bit, um, I don't know, silly or lawyerly or something to start talking about the validity of a, of a, of a, a, a commitment between two people of that kind. Or just if you promised to phone your mum on the weekend and and you didn't, of course, it was a valid promise. But do we just not use the word valid that way? I don't know. I find uh, Kelson's approach attractive. And I think it was a valid promise if it, if it was a promise. And, and it's not a promise if it, if it wasn't valid. And, and I don't know if Hart would say, well, you can't say that it's valid or invalid. Of course it was valid if you promised it. Um, and, and, and if it's not valid, then it doesn't even counts the promise. I, so I, I don't I don't see why we shouldn't have a redundancy theory of validity. Um, Maris calls validity a technique. I wonder if that's rather paraphrastic, um, an indirect way of talking, because if you have a redundancy theory of validity, then how about this? The law needs to regulate its own validity. I think, I think that's a way in which you might go one step beyond Kelsen. Kelsen, you may have heard his slogan that the law needs to regulate it, its own creation. Um, I think you might say, and this is an idea that comes from reading Maris' work, that the law needs to regulate its own validity and has techniques, a lot, a wide array of techniques, and, and the book is, is a compendium of them and, and a deep, broad, broad, broad and deep, <coughs> Uh, exploration of the techniques by which law regulates its own validity. And then I wonder if you're paraphrasing Maris when you say that validity is a technique. It seems to me that validity is normative force and and you've written about law's techniques for regulating its own validity. Um, and I wonder about that. But I copied the blurb off the internet. It's also on the back of the book. and. It, it could give you another taste of, of the um, this uh, lucid and and uh, and succinct prose. This book shows that validity can help a political community to foster justice, precisely because validity does not primarily turn on moral considerations. Validity serves both to both allocate and limit a distinct kind of power, and so on. Validity can enable persons and institutions to rally the resources and opportunities that only large-scale behavior convergence can afford. Well, what if we just replace the word validity with law in this account of what we get from the book? This book shows that law can help a political community to foster justice precisely because law does not primarily turn on moral considerations. Law serves to both allocate and limit a distinct kind of power, and so on. Um, by entrusting the capacity to decide to those who in justice ought to bear it, law can enable persons and institutions to rally the resources and opportunities. Um, so there you go. I, I regard this book as a book about law and what's original and really fruitful is the um, perspective from which Maris is, is um, unpacking the value and the nature of law, um, uh, the, the way of looking at the phenomena that Hart was uh, trying to um, elucidate. And, there, and there's, uh, 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 there's more elucidation to be found um, here. I'm, I'm hesitant about this, having a redundancy theory of validity, because of what I said about Hart, it kind of makes sense. That we hesitate to say that it would, that um, that if I promised my mom to phone her and and um, and and you criticize me for not doing it and, and I say, 
well, um, she she leaned on me to phone her last week, and so the promise wasn't valid. You know, I'm not dealing with my responsibility to my mum in a, in, a, in a, you might say, in a, in a, in the way a good son ought to, if I'm starting to talk about the validity of, of a norm um, in my a, a duty uh, towards her. So there's something about validity, I have to admit, that sounds kind of law-ish. Law and the title, you can't replace the word validity in the title, you'd end up with legal law. Um, so I'm not, I'm not saying we should have the redundancy theory of validity, but I'm, I'm wondering if we should. Um, the fabric of justice, my, my, my last question, because I'm going to park for reasons of time, a really technical question about the difference between declarative and constitutive rulings. Read the, uh, read the discussion of rulings in this book, which is uh, groundbreaking. Um, my last question is about, uh, again, about the title. Um, is it also legal validity? Is it also the fabric of injustice? Um, you know, uh, for, for certain sorts of injustices, you need a, you need a marriage to be valid. <laughs> uh, and you can imagine injustices that you can only get away with, you can only inflict, you can only perpetrate if, uh, if the marriage is valid. Um, and uh, I, I, would, I would say that um, the, the really important truth implied by the title is that law, validity of law, legal validity, uh, in using my redundancy theory, say either one, legal validity, law, um, say it either way, it's a necessity for the sake of justice in a political community. There, there's a, a unnecessary connection between law and justice. And, 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 and also, um, I would also say there are certain injustices that can only be inflicted um, because of the law and, and be, or because of legal validity, as you will. Um, and so I think that it's a book about the fabric of injustice as well. It's just that if your strategy is to be maximally unjust, law is a bit of a detail. Um, it, it, it will give you special opportunities. Whereas if you're, if, you're, um, if you're in a position where you can change the way things work in a political community, then um, adopting law, legal validity, using legal, the technique of legal validity that Maris describes is uh, um, necessary. Um, so there is a, a difference between the relation between law and justice and the law of injustice, and, and the relation between law and injustice. Thank you, Maris. And thank you, Timothy. Uh, please give a hand for three wonderful comments. Thank you to all three of you. It's been delightful to have this conversation, and I'm, I'm so glad that we can do that. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And, uh, you know, I won't even try to address each of the many exciting points you've put on the table. Um, I've noted a couple of things I would like to, um, you know, raise in these uh, 15 minutes. I'll try to keep it short and low key. Maybe we can always have a discussion later on. So I think I've noted down seven things, but you know, numbers may change. The first thing is not a reply, it's actually um, a preface. So, um, well, you know, this book was rewritten, uh, so it, it was based on an, an initial doctoral work which then got eventually rewritten after and during, really, a long and arduous career break due to family health reasons. And all I want to say at this stage is that during all those months and even a couple of years in which circumstances had brought me in a very different place in an entirely different environment where I had every opportunity to forget that I had once been an academic and loved doing and writing and thinking in the way I did. And trust me, there were lots of reasons to do that. 
there was some little rays of light they kept me um, connected to my former self and it's true that a number of people contributed to that to that but um, there were maybe two people in particular who are here today in who in different roles um, assisted that so one of them was Richard Ekins uh, who relentlessly um, would encourage me from time to time to come back to make arrangements to come to Oxford and not deflected by my lack of reply or my negative replies he would renovate the proposal and the invitations until the time was right for me to take them up so I do appreciate that and uh, secondly Paul Yao uh, who as a martyr went through the final stages of the manuscript actually getting me to do it and you can't believe how much I chopped from the manuscript thanks to this hero. So, you know, if you read through and you feel, you know, this is not too dense, um, you know, there's some density in the end notes, but they're actually ghetto it, right? That's the point, not to have people read this and have steam coming out of the ears, but actually survive, you know, and be able to lead a life after they read this. Um, Largely, this is thanks to some masterful interventions by Paul Yowell, who um, in some lengthy parts of the manuscript that would originally say things like, you know, I shall now uh, discuss in detail the existing literature on, and I would get these side comments in words saying, sense of foreboding, <laughs> <laughs> um, which duly led me to, to chop off things. On the bright side, there's lots of material that is unpublished that I may get to publish, and it's not necessarily the, the, the boring stuff, but stuff that uh, came in the conclusion and where I was getting a little bit too negative about injustice and Lo Valerie's capacity to foster injustice in incredible ways. And Paul thought, I think, wisely, Myers, this is a conclusion. You don't want to end on a negative note. So there will be stuff written about this eventually. So that was the first point, a bit longer than I expected. Second point, right, um, redundancy theory of validity. I think validity is pretty much redundant in one sense of redundant. I mean, if you think of it as being empty, right? What does it mean? Well, probably doesn't mean much. It's just something we use and we can agree on and, you know, spot. But we could replace it with any other word, <laughs> right? In that sense, I think it is, it is redundant. I don't think it's redundant in the sense that we could do without, right? in that sense. Um, in fact, what got me interested in, in this whole thing and is uh, precisely the apparent placeholder role that this term is, 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 is you know, having. But not just when we speak of norms, for God's sake, which is what most of us in legal theory have been doing for decades, right? I mean, there's nothing wrong with talking about valid norms, you know, don't get me wrong, but there are valid bus tickets, valid job appointments, valid pension grounds, valid, pat valid patents, valid, uh, you name it, right? Which shape people's lives in, in tremendous ways, which lay people are just as comfortable with as we are. You know, people know if they have a valid bus ticket, even if they don't understand what a bus ticket is. <laughs> no, never mind what validity is, you know? But we can sort of agree. We have this sort of overlapping consensus that sounds a bit wrong. Um, on on that idea, and I think I find that fascinating. I mean, you you, you and I, I mean, I never thought progress could be made by asking what is validity. That's why I asked why, right? What uh, probably doesn't get us too far. Um, so it works as a placeholder, but so do many other legal terms, like contract, for example. Right? I mean, there's it's, it's just a wonderful placeholder word that we use in law to summarize. Uh, lots of different configurations of rights and duties and powers. Yeah? And we can get more specific placeholders. We can say it's a, you know equipment lease contract and we know something more. Right? And we can get even more precise or we can just drop the placeholder and start explaining what each of the rights and duties are under there. But it's convenient to use these short-term words. And I think valid is, in a sense, the master placeholder. Right? You can just say it's just valid, never mind if it's a valid contract or valid will or valid whatever. Right? Um, and uh, is that something we should, as it were, worry about in legal theory? Yes, but we should worry about having in mind very clearly that 
what we're explaining is a reality that exists in law, right? So it's not like we are, legal theorists, sort of making up this you know, idea of validity, is it a placeholder? We're not designing it, you know. We have to account for what legal reasoning in practice actually uses. So I think it is a matter of law that these terms work as placeholders. And that is intriguing, that is fascinating, both if you're interested in a specific branch of law, private law, public law, or if you're actually, as a legal theorist, trying to look over all branches. So um, I do think it's a um, redundant in that sense, but I also think it is a matter of law, that redundancy, and that there's a lot there to be explained. And um, my next step in trying to figure that out, and that leads me to point three, and to something Nikolai, um, I think, was pointing out, is, you know, um, I was asking, okay, you know, mm, we're probably not gonna get a lot of clarity from legal theory about how this sort of spell of validity works. I mean, we use this word, we appeal to it, we seal people's faith in its name, and yet nobody seems really to have addressed the question, what it means. We don't need to know what it means. We can operate in law really competently without having the slightest idea of what validity means. All we need to know is whether something is valid, right? the criteria for validity. Um, so, well, you know, one option is that we're just under a, a malicious spell. It just means nothing. And we've been for a roughly 2,000 years, you know, doing a lot of stuff in the name of something that might have historically have a meaning, maybe no longer. The other option is that there is something common to the various kinds of action and object that we refer to as valid. And by the way, when I say object, that includes valid PIN codes, valid credit cards, and so on, you know. I try to explain how all of these things ultimately result from that technique. And in order to uh, just uh, explore that hypothesis, I asked myself, well, you know, we can't really draw a lot of help from the validity of norms literature. It's not just norms that we're talking about, we're talking about so many other things in legal practice. And yet, there is a very intriguing um, line of literature on legal power, which seems to broadly overlap with this phenomenon, phenomena that I'm interested in, right? In the sense that what people like Hart, but even much earlier than Hart, Suarez, for example, uh, the 17th century, spoke of as legal power, Bentham, for example, pretty much coincides with the things we speak of as valid. Right? You might say it's just a coincidence at the level of language. I tried to see in the initial chapters whether it's more than just a coincidence at the level of language, whether there's something we can figure out. And that's why I am interested in figuring out this idea of legal power, right? because a search for a common denominator, so to speak, that might underlie these various things, realities, that we refer to and use and appeal to and loathe as being valid. And I do, in fact, find that the idea of legal power and the ways we exercise legal power um, properly refined um, can get us that far, which is why, uh, as Nikolai insisted, I, I, you know, I, I look at how legal power is exercised and I conclude that it's very much to do with manifesting your intention to do it. It's like yeah, it's self-fulfilling. Um, that brings me to a point that um, Raquel was uh, making. That's my fourth point, by the way, already. So you can see I'm doing well. Um, which is, you know, well, you know, there's a whole literature that many of you will be familiar with from the philosophy of language about performatives, right? So uh, things you accomplish, not by doing something, particular action, but specifically by saying that you intend to accomplish them, yeah? It's not easy to um, exercise a legal power. I mean, the conditions must be true, right? Um, but under the right conditions, by saying I intend to accomplish something, I actually do accomplish it, right? So imagine I say, Nick, you know, you're wonderful. I, I really intend to marry you. Yeah, that's my intention or my desire, whatever. I mean, yeah, usually if it, you know, if at the moment I do not have a legal power to do that, amongst other things, because Nick is happily married already, so it would be invalid in law, right? But under the right circumstances, in the right ceremony, and with the right presuppositions, by saying, yes, I do intend to marry, and so on, I actually bring it about, what I say. And I think that's a remarkable and fascinating power that the law can bestow in the eyes of individuals and groups. It's true of private law, it's true of public law, it's true of legislature, right? And um, so, as Raquel is entirely right when she says, it's not that the choice as such is self-fulfilling. I mean, I could choose whether or not to have um, 
some sip of water and the fact that I choose it doesn't, you know, I don't think in any interesting sense make the cells self-fulfilling. But if what I'm choosing here is as between, say, marrying or not marrying, right? Or as between signing a contract or not signing it, as between enacting a legislative proposal to change the law in a certain way or not, uh, and so on. That is a special kind of choice. Yeah? It's a choice that has propositional content. Yeah? The choice to, well, to make something true by expressing that very choice. Yeah? And I think, um, in that sense, the choice it is a choice to do something by expressing that choice. Yeah? And in that very special sense, this particular kind of choice can be self-fulfilling. Yeah? It's not true of, of choices in, in general, or at least not in the sense I'm interested in. But it's this very special feature of these. Um, and then, you know, what, one shouldn't get the sense, and that's point five, one shouldn't get the sense, though, that we are here, you know, having an inflationist account of the role of these choices of ballot action in law. Yeah? Um, there are various points in the book where I seek to stress, and possibly I didn't do it enough, that's quite possible, that validity is just one way of making law. Right? It happens to be the way that I focus on. Partly because I think that unless we get a clear sense of what that is, um, we won't be able to discriminate the other senses. Right? It's all too easy to just have a nebulous sense, it's law, law, law is valid, norms are valid, and then you know, suddenly everything goes in the cupboard of validity. And I think if we can delineate just what it is focally that we do and undo through this technique of validity, namely doing something by saying so, changing rights and duties by expressing an intent to that effect, then we can, as it were, by analogy or even by contrast, work out other ways of making law, which I think are comparatively underexplored, although there's been fascinating writing already on them. And I'm thinking, of course, of judge-made law, and I'm thinking of customary law, right? So um, I do share the admiration, and in fact, it's been a great source of insight, uh, of John Gardner's, uh, I think, seminal uh, distinction, well, not distinction, but his actual article on point called Some Types of Law. It's reprinted in Law of the Leap of Faith, OUP 2012 where he carefully distinguishes these three different types of making law. One is enacted law, or legislated law, which would, as it were, coincide fully with the technique of validity, yeah? making something true by saying it, by uttering the legislative proposal and so on. Then there's case law, right, which is you make, he says, a norm by applying it, but not by announcing it. Yeah? Um, so the law made is not necessarily the law that the judge the rule that the judge articulated in his judgment when pronouncing on the particular case, right? We have to ask as lawyers, as law teachers, you know, what is the rule that makes sense of the results reached? Um, and there may be several possible candidates. And then thirdly, of course, custom, right? which is not even intentional in that way in which case law is intentional. So what I suggest, at, I think at somewhere in chapter five and chapter six, is that these other two techniques, so the, these other ways of, shouldn't call it technique, and I don't know enough about it to call it a technique, but these other two ways of making law, you know, customary law and case law, um, I think, although they are not focally involving the technique of validity, because you don't, you know, the normative, the rule is not made by being articulated, but I think that, uh, it is indirectly made through the technique of validity in the following, in at least some cases, yeah? Um, case law, for example, it takes a judgment to make, you know, it takes a ruling to make a rule. So you need a judge to say, I herewith, you know, um, sentence this plaintiff to whatever, you know, I herewith, you know, decide for damages and so on. So the judgment is such, the ruling is actually a direct application of the technique of validity, right? So you change the legal positions by articulating that case dismissed, uh, appeal uh, dismissed and so on. And you need that to then, you know, create, I mean, for the rule, as it were, the general rule to come into being. So um, I suggest at various points that, you know, it trades on the technique as case law making. Yeah? Um, case law, yeah, it, it trades on the technique of validity, even though it doesn't focally 
used it. And as for customary law, you, you might say, how, how is that connected? Well, if we think of, as it were, customs like judicial customs, right, um, which accounts for a substantial part of customary law that we're interested in as, as lawyers, right? Customs, customary rules that have developed as a result of judges repeatedly treating certain um, propositions as law. You know? The doctrine of stare decisis itself is a customary doctrine. Right? Well, then again, you can make the same point. Yeah? It takes judges in the exercise of their powers, of the valid, uh, you know, their ability to make valid law, to reach that custom. What about commercial custom? Yeah? Well, again, you know, it's the fact that people make contracts, <laughs> valid contracts, by you know, expressing their intention to agree to certain things with people that eventually, as it were, adds up to what we might call lex mercatoria and so on. Um, I don't want to push this too far. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm quite hesitant whether you can explain every legally relevant custom in the same way, but I suspect that much can be gained here by having a focal meaning peripheral meaning approach, for central case, peripheral case approach. I think that the technique of validity, though it doesn't explain all ways of making law, indeed all valuable and necessary ways of making law, um, can shed some light in at least a number of these other ways. As I said initially, either by analogy or perhaps even by contrast. And my aim was just, let's get clear about this one, and that might help us better demarcate the others. So I, I really welcome um, these comments. And um, I thought um, Mikolai's point in that connection is really, really fascinating. Uh, the question whether, you know, is there then a power being exercised, right? A power to make case law. Yeah? Um, I haven't addressed this here. I think one can learn a lot. I'm definitely going to read <laughs> his uh, solution. Um, let me only say that there are plenty of circumstances in which law assigns certain conduct, law-changing effect, short of awarding a legal power. Think of common law marriage, as opposed to that kind of, I mean, the marriage that Timothy was talking about, right? So the fact that people continually cohabitate, eventually, you know, ha gives them the ability, so to speak, to reach a status which in law is equivalent to that of a married couple that goes through the ceremony and explicitly says on a particular day and time, I wish to marry this other person. Yeah? Is it a legal power? <laughs> yeah? Well, it's not focally a legal power, right? Because it's a protracted exercise. It doesn't matter whether you declare it. It's all about what you do. Yeah? There's plenty. I mean, there's, I think I address it in, a, in an end note as usual and on page 65. Um, there's plenty of these conducts in most legal systems. Yeah? More continental systems in administrative law, they have the doctrine of administrative silence. Yeah? So what if you make a request? file a request with the administration and the administration doesn't reply. So there's law in certain circumstances about whether the request is deemed, should be deemed to have been approved or not. Did the uh, administration exercise a legal power in being silent? Well, not really. Um, but the result is going to be quite similar, right? Um, and there might be even more familiar cases. So driving into a car park, yeah? are you thereby um, you know, consenting to enter the contract and so on. You know, I don't think we need to worry whether the person manifested that intent or not because the law is going to treat you as being bound in any case. So it's very convenient, very useful for legal systems to assign, as it were, these law-changing effects to plenty of conduct, which, uh, um, of course, aside from super Trump and criminal law examples, which are obviously not meant for the same purpose as a legal power, but to other conduct in the field of private law, administrative law, and so on, which for practical purpose can serve a very similar effect, and it prevents us from having to worry whether this person had an intention or didn't have an intention. So are these legal powers? Um, well, part of me thinks maybe we don't need to figure out, and part of me thinks, well, it might be extremely interesting to figure it out in special cases, like the case of uh, the situation of case law. So I just welcome the question, and I, I hope to have explained why I think it's important. And um, so I think I've just got the final two points, which are quite quick, um, which is, ah, right, is it about law or is it about validity, right? Is this about law, is it about validity? Well, I want to think that, let's leave aside what I want to think. Uh, my aim was to explain um, why validity makes law good and what it is good. 
right? So inevitably, it's about law, right? And chapter four, you'll see a whole story about you know why law is more needed uh, in terms of what some years ago was referred to as coordination. It's a, a language that I ditched for various <laughs> reasons. <laughs> I thought it was too obscure, so it's now it's now called specific convergence. That's 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 the fashionable name. I, I've just invented it. You know, mm -hmm. It's fashion. It's, it's good. Um, you know, I, I think you need to understand that in order to understand why the technique of validity equips law to achieve uh, to, to be able to make this difference to community life. Right. So I think it's inevitably about law. Yeah. But it's not simply about law. It's specifically about this one tool set validity, which is quite pervasive, but certainly not the only one for reasons I've just explained. Um, that I think has special virtues uh, to help law accomplish what it needs to accomplish. And one of these virtues is, I think, its capacity to allocate legal power yeah? and to distribute legal power. And that brings in, I think, a lot of institutional questions that I try to look at in the final chapters, which I think have, well, I would love more legal theorists to focus on them, right? Um, I think it's a fascinating technique for combining both the self-directing choice, as Raquel um, helpfully stressed, right, the ability of me as an individual to bind myself to others, to make my own mistakes, to, to inter commitments, uh, responsibilities, whether they're commercial or family or whatever, and for groups too, to self-determine, right, but at the same time to do this in a way that is compatible with the choices of others rather than clashing with them, right. Inevitably, that's going to mean, if you wish to use the Razian terminology of autonomy, that's going to mean limiting everyone's autonomy. But as you know, as being good readers of Raz, or just thinkers about this matter, um, we don't need unlimited autonomy to live a good life. Right? In fact, my autonomy needs to be limited. I must be capable of limiting my own autonomy in order to live a valuable life. Yeah? I must be able to enter into commitments, friendships, partnerships, and so on, which are going to limit what I can morally do in the future. But that, in turn, is an expression of my valuable self-direction. And I think this is true of everyone, just of me, of course. <laughs> and it's also true of groups and institutions in a legal order. And I think validity has this incredible potential to both channel this, this self-direction of individuals and groups and yet make it compatible with the self-direction of others. And that's where the limits come in, the criteria of validity, the many ways in which one cannot, one doesn't have unlimited choice in, you know, re realizing a valid act. That's why as lawyers we know there's, there's purported valid acts which are defeatable, defeasible, ultra virus, right? And in various ways, uh, not acceptable as a matter of law. That's the bread and butter of huge branches of legal order. And I think that's properly used, this ability to empower somebody and in so doing, limit their sphere of competence. Yeah. That's what you can decide about, but not more, <laughs> right? Uh, that is an incredible tool, which we all know, but it's worth reflecting on. And I think it's worth reflecting on, not just for general jurisprudence, but also for many particular areas of law. So I, I would invite you to do that. And um, the final point is, of course, the injustice that can come with all of that, right? Um, so it's a very dangerous technique. Imagine seeing, you know, determining morally relevant, crucial questions about people's fate by reference to what somebody intended, what somebody said. It may not even be, be their real intention, because all you need is to manifest that intention. So, you know, for all we know, the, the legislators may have been drunk when they, you know, walked through the lobby, as, as Waldron said. Um, and similarly, you, you know, you can sign up a binding contract in a way you didn't intend. You know? It's just enough that you a reasonable person would have taken you to intent. Timothy has a lovely article on this from 1997, I think it's quoted here. So, yes, it's very dangerous. It's scary, in fact. Uh, the more I've written about it, the more freaked I am by validity. There's so much uh, it can destroy in personal relationships, uh, and, and, and generally, right? Um, there's, again, a danger to think in an inflationist way about validity. Um, not, not only because there's more to life than justice and to moral life than justice, but I think there's also more to justice than validity, yeah? which is why I hesitated in using the, the pronoun the fabric of justice. I, you know, part of me wanted to write a fabric of justice, but I consulted with some colleagues 
and uh, <laughs> the general view was that it was probably okay as long as it was explained um, adequately in the book. So I think there are the, these hazards. Uh, it definitely can be a fabric of injustice. Uh, wait for my piece on point. Uh, it could be a fabric of you know wasting time, a fabric of exploitation, a fabric of many other things. And there's so many more books than to be written about that. I in no way disclaim that. I was just focusing, or at least making my first step, by saying you know if we use it well, gosh, that's what we could achieve, right? And, and, and it's been used for a while, it's not an invention that, that we've made, but I think it's not that long ago that legal thought has reflexively um, thought about it, as it were. Right? Even the Romans used validity in a sense, um, but uh, it's only with modern constitutionalism, as, as Timothy was, was recalling, that somehow legal thought Sorry, I mean Western legal thought, of course. Yeah, there's so many more <laughs> kinds of legal thought. Western legal thought becomes self-conscious in a way that Kelsen's view, Kelsen's theory, glorifies. Yeah, law about law, reasons about reasons, theory about theory. Does that sound familiar? That's what we've been doing in the last decades, right? I think that with children of modern constitutionalism, which is the moment when law realizes or legal thought realizes that not only wills and contracts and marriages can be valid by law itself can be valid or invalid. How cool is that? It can be valid or invalid because itself it's regulated by law, something Hart explains to us very happily. And the need for that idea is especially poignant after World War II when we want constitutionally enshrined human rights to legally limit what the legislature can do and not only be a nice, beautiful proclaim with no legal effect, right? And I think after that, legal thought really exploits with that, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it should make us think that we've come up with it, we've invented it. It's been there for a while. This is probably a really bad publicity stunt, but the, the companion book to this is called A Short History of Legal Validity and Invalidity, Foundations of Private and Public Law, where I try to explain just that. Um, the best thing about the book, without any doubt, is that it has drawings. Mm. And the best thing about the drawings is that my mother made them. And other than that, it's short and not too expensive. So <laughs> let me close again by thanking everyone who's been contributing today. And maybe we, if we still have some time for discussion, then hopefully we can use it. And uh, it's been a pleasure and a great privilege. Thank you. Thank you.